Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. If you've seen this channel before, you know that I love math, but I'm also interested in how mathematical ideas come to be and the people who create them. So today, I thought I'd talk a bit about the history of math, and I can't think of anyone more appropriate to start with than Archimedes. First, let's set our scene. Archimedes was from Syracuse on the island of Sicily. In the modern day, that's part of Italy, but at the time, it was an independent, culturally Greek city-state. Dates are a little sketchy for anything that old, but he lived roughly from 287 to 212 BC. For context, in the 300s BC, Alexander the Great led Macedonia to conquer the world from Greece eastward to India. He died in 323 BC, and almost immediately, his successors partitioned his empire and declared several decades of war on each other. So, this side of the Mediterranean was still recovering from a major succession crisis. Further west, there were two major powers, Carthage in North Africa and a small Italian republic called Rome. As both grew they started to clash in what became known as the Punic Wars. The primary battlefield was that big island between them, Sicily, and Syracuse, in its strategic location, got the short end of the stick, falling to Rome in 212 BC, and Archimedes was killed in the siege. And, of course, Rome went on to win that war and become the largest empire the world had ever seen. In terms of mathematical history, various ideas had been studied for millennia, but the notion of rigorous proof was invented by Thales around 600 BC. The Pythagorean theorem was proven shortly afterward in the 500s BC. Then there were some more mathematicians like Eudoxus in the 300s BC, who made early contributions, mostly in geometry and number theory. Around 300 BC, Euclid compiled many of these results into his Elements, which laid out the foundations for geometry. And that's less than 20 years before Archimedes was born, so even the basic principles of geometry were still fairly new. Jumping forward a bit to the late 200s BC, we get Apollonius, who gave us some of the earliest results on conic sections and 3D geometry. And then, in the 100s BC, we have Hipparchus, who founded the study of trigonometry, which means Archimedes was doing his work entirely without any of that as a background. Archimedes wasn't the only mathematician of his day, either. He also had some important contemporaries. Notable among them was his friend Eratosthenes, down in Alexandria, who first computed the size of the Earth around 240 BC. And several of Archimedes' works were actually written as letters to Eratosthenes. But I'd like to talk about Archimedes' math, not just his place in history. His most famous result comes from his measurement of a circle, where he showed that a circle with its radius and circumference has the same area as a right triangle, where the radius is on one side and the circumference is on the other. That is, the area is equal to one-half the height, which is r, times the base, which is the circumference, 2 pi r. Or, putting that together, we get the area of a circle is pi r squared. Yeah, Archimedes is the one who first proved that. His method was to inscribe a sequence of polygons into the circle and then to divide these polygons into a collection of triangles. Then the area of each triangle is given by one-half its base times its height, where the base is the side length, and the height is something a little bit less than the radius. So, putting all of the triangles together, we get that the area of the polygon is going to be something less then one-half times the sum of the side lengths, which is the perimeter, times the radius. 
And since the perimeter is composed of straight line segments, that's going to be something less than one half times the circumference times the radius. But as we take a sequence of polygons with more and more sides, the perimeter of this polygon gets closer and closer to the circumference. And the height of each triangle is going to get closer and closer to the radius. So even though the area is always less than one half the circumference times the radius, it's going to get as close as we want. And by very similar logic, if we take a sequence of polygons that are tangent to the circle from the outside, then we'll get that the area of these polygons is going to be greater than one-half the circumference times the radius, but again, it's going to be as close as we want. So we've got a series of polygons expanding from the inside and a series of polygons contracting from the outside, which bound the area of the circle above and below at one-half the circumference times the radius. So the area of the circle must be the same as the area of the triangle. And if this argument sounds a lot like limits and integrals just 1,900 years before the invention of calculus, yeah, it kind of is. In addition, Archimedes found estimates for pi. Once again, he used the same inscribed polygon trick as before, this time starting with a regular hexagon. And by dividing it into equilateral triangles, he was able to see that each side had the same length as the radius. Then by constructing a radius to bisect each side, he was able to create a polygon with 12 sides, twice as many. And using the Pythagorean theorem a couple times on all of these right triangles, he was able to find the length of each of the new sides, and thus the perimeter of the whole polygon. And by repeating this process, he could double the sides until he had a really good approximation of a circle and a really good estimate. Finally, he applied known approximations for square roots to get estimates for the perimeter, and thus for pi. And the values he got showed that pi was between 223 over 71 and 22 over 7. Another of his accomplishments was addressing the problem of big numbers. In Archimedes' day, Greek mathematicians worked with Greek numerals, which, like Roman numerals, used letters to represent numbers. They had different letters for 1 through 9, and 10 through 90, and 100 through 900. And then there were special symbols that could be added onto a letter for multiples of 1,000, kiliads, and multiples of 10,000, myriads. But this system was limited. There was no easy way to handle really big numbers. You'd run out of letters around a myriad of myriads, which is 100 million or 10 to the 8th. There was no way to even talk about a number as large as, say, the number of grains of sand in the universe. In The Sand Reckoner, Archimedes did exactly that. To get an upper bound, he supposed the universe was a really big sphere, and he used astronomical data to estimate its size. Then he did some geometry to figure out how much sand could be packed into that sphere if it was completely filled. In modern notation, this estimate comes out to around 10 to the 63rd. But as we just said, Greek numerals weren't up to the task. They couldn't describe numbers that big. So he had to invent a system for working with really large numbers. What he came up with was essentially scientific notation. A number was described as a small number multiplied by a power of a myriad of myriads. And using this notation, he could describe numbers up to 10 to the 8th, to the 10 to the 8th, 
to the 10 to the 8th, which is a pretty big number. And think about that. Before Archimedes, no one was even thinking about numbers more than 100 million. In the intro to The Sand Reckoner, he even claimed that people thought it was impossible to describe a number that big. But he was comfortably working with numbers orders of magnitude greater than that. And it wasn't until the 1600s that mathematicians came up with modern scientific notation. In addition to his work in math, Archimedes also made several scientific discoveries. He famously discovered the principle of buoyancy, which has since been named for him, that a floating object displaces an amount of water equal to its weight. So, as you press down on an object, the water level rises. There's a popular story that he used this result to identify a fake crown. The king had a crown he suspected was made of silver instead of gold, and he tasked Archimedes with proving it. Supposedly, Archimedes noticed that the water level rose when he stepped into the bath, and he discovered buoyancy. But he probably didn't distinguish gold from silver that way. At the time, there weren't devices precise enough to measure the difference. He also probably didn't run naked through the streets, screaming Eureka, either. Another of his big results was the law of levers, that objects balance on a lever when their distances to the fulcrum are inversely proportional to their masses. That is, if one object is twice as heavy as another, then it has to be half the distance away in order to balance. To prove it, he defined what's known as the center of mass. He noticed that if two equal parts were split off from a mass and moved the same distance in opposite directions, then the center wouldn't move, and so the balance point wouldn't change. So if a lever was balanced with two masses, let's say three units over here and four units over here, then each of these masses could be split into a collection of one unit masses. So one, two, three here, and one, two, three, four here. And those masses could be moved apart in pairs in such a way that they ended up evenly spaced. And the balance point for the two original masses would have to be the same balance point as for all of the unit masses. And since these masses are evenly spaced, that's just going to be this central point here. And finding the distances to each of the two masses, we see that this one is four units away, and this one is three units away. And more generally, the masses are going to be in inverse proportion to the distances. Archimedes was also a prolific inventor. Some of his devices were instruments of war to aid in the defense of Syracuse. For example, he built a weapon that was essentially a grappling hook on a crane that could grab invading Roman ships and sink them. Other inventions were a bit more mundane. He developed a screw-like pump to move water, which is still in common use today. And he created a device that would drop a stone every time a chariot wheel turned, which is basically an odometer, which let him measure the length of roads. And he did so much more that I just don't have the time to cover. I've linked a bunch of references in the description, and you should definitely check them out. Here's a list of Archimedes' surviving works. It's likely incomplete, a lot of writing has been destroyed or misplaced over the millennia, but what we do have shows that he did some truly amazing things. He was centuries ahead of his time, and the breadth and depth of his mathematical contributions set the stage for math for the next 2,000 years. I hope I've shown you some small fraction of the incredible work that he did. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.